All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant peace and send His blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Upon his companions and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the day of judgment. Human beings are amazing. Amazing. Amazing creatures. How quickly, how quickly they change their minds and their statements. Particularly when it goes against desires. People do wild things when you deal with their desires or when you try to you're not really attacking but you're trying to mention some things which kind of conflict with their desires amazing things happen things that you think human beings would never do but they do them this particular quality of the children of adam has existed ever since we can remember it goes all the way back to the people of Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. You all know Nuh and what he had to go through with his people. What happened with the people of Nuh as the ulama mentioned is that there used to be some righteous people that worshipped Allah and were slaves of him or slaves of his subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they passed away the shaitan came to those individuals who remained and told them, you know, these were wonderful people and you're going to let their memory just go? They, they will be no, how will you remember them? How will you get encouraged to worship Allah at the time of, at the time when you're feeling a little lazy? Why don't you make statues, idols in their shape, in their appearance, not to worship them, no, 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 no. Only so that anytime you're feeling lazy, you remember, you look at these statues, you say, this was, you know, Fulan, and this was Fulan, what wonderful people. We need to worship Allah like they used to worship Allah, so you will get encouraged to worship Allah. That's how it began. Sure enough, they listened to him, they built the statues, and all of a sudden, when the generations started to die, and the new generations came unaware of what was happening in the past and the intent behind building these or, or uh, sculpturing these statues they started to actually worship them not, not denying Allah, no but they were worship, worshipping them in a sense that they wanted these people to get them to Allah <clears throat> these are righteous people and they will intercede for them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah sent Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. And what did Nuh say? He warned them. Qala abudullah ma lakum min ilahin ghayru. Worship Allah. You have no other gods besides Him. And you read Surah Nuh. <clears throat> what did Allah say? Amazing. At some point after He gave him da'wah for Allah knows how many years and they would close their ears when He would give him da'wah. They would cover their faces with their clothes. They're not trying to hear it. Allah said, وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا And they plotted a mighty plot. Not just an, any average, you know, scam. This was some hardcore plotting. وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَيَغُوثًا وَيَعُوقًا وَنَسْرًا And they said, do not abandon your gods. Don't leave them alone. Don't leave them alone. And don't leave what the wasu'ah, these are the names of these, according to the ulama of tafsir, these righteous people, whom they erected statues in their appearance and their resemblance. And not only that, now here's the point. Now this is already evil. This is evil. Rejecting, worshipping Allah alone, insisting on setting up intermediaries between us and Allah. This is a problem enough. But they didn't stop there. They said to Nuh, Inna lanaraka fi dalalin mubin. Verily, we see that you are in clear, manifest, deviance, error, misguidance. You're no good. This is the Messenger of Allah. Now, they are the rightly guided, and Nuh is astray, according to them. He said, my people, I don't have any, any deviance in me. 
Nay, but I'm a messenger from the Lord of everything, from the Lord of everything that exists. When they rejected, what did Allah do? What did Allah do? Everybody was drowned. Right or wrong? He built the ark. Allah saved him and those who believed with him, which were a minority, the animals which Allah decreed would remain, and everything else was gone. These people were destroyed. Now, history repeated itself over and over again with the prophets and the messengers that were sent again and again. Read the Quran. This is no mystery to any Muslim. No mystery to any Muslim. That every nation, that same, same risala, same message. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ We haven't sent a messenger before you, except that we reveal unto him that there is no God worthy of worship but I, so worship me. And they rejected, they were destroyed. They rejected, they were destroyed until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, what was he called? What was he called among his people? What was his title? Yes. As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. Everybody knows that. Sadiq from Sidq. He was truthful. Ameen, trustworthy. You can trust him. No one disputed that. The Kuffar and everybody there, regardless of their tribe, regardless of their background, there was no difference of opinion among the Kuffar that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was what? As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. And all of a sudden, he starts calling them to Tawheed, and things change. He becomes, وقال الكافرون هذا ساحر كذاب عوذ بالله. And the disbeliever said, this is a magician, a lying magician. كذاب is different than كاذب. كاذب is someone who may lie. كذاب, this is his quality. Now look, الصادق became كذاب, a liar. أجعل الآلهة إلها واحدة هذا لشيء عجاب. Now listen to this, cra crazy stuff. Crazy stuff human beings say. He made the gods one god? This is amazing. This is a curious thing. How, how could the many gods become one god? As if, as if we were created with the natural disposition of believing in multiple gods. And Tawheed suddenly came. It's the other way around. We were born with worshipping Allah alone. Then Shirk came. They said, this is something amazing. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَتَارِكُوا آلِهَتِنَا لِشَاعِرٍ مَجْنُونَ Allah described their affair. They used to be, whenever it was said to them, there's no God worthy of worship but Allah, يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ They would act arrogantly. They were prideful. And then they say, are we going to leave our gods? For what? سَاحِرٍ Majnoon, for a mad poet. So far we have five titles. Kathab, magician, mad, poet, and in another ayah, they call them what? A kahin, a soothsayer. They combine five, the most evil titles you can think of people. The most evil, the, you know, crazy, liar, magician, Fortune teller, you know the whole thing. This was who? According to them, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because he was calling them to what? Tawheed. Their desires were not really cool with Tawheed. There was no room for Tawheed, so now they had to come up with stuff. So much so, that at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when someone became a Muslim, they would say, Saba'a. Saba'a Umar. You know what Saba'a mean? He deviated. And they called the Muslimin Deen al-Sabi'in, the religion of the deviants. And we were called Subat, Subat with the ta. They used to, the, the Kuffar, whenever someone become a Muslim, they say, oh, he's just gone astray. He just went astray. Not that Allah guided him. They considered that they were in, in guidance, and when you become a Muslim, you go astray. Now, what am I aiming at here? You may be wondering, what are you giving us, a history lesson here? No, no, no. I'm trying to prove a point. Whenever the people of desires and innovations and, and uh, misguidance 
Whenever they are confronted with the truth and they intend on rejecting it, they create labels. They create names that will scare the people away. Be careful. These are such and such. Don't go there in order to mislead the common people and they will not find their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. This is their quality. This is their quality. This is a lesson which we learn. And what does that tell us concerning now? Why is this related to the topic? Because in our last discussion on the Sufis, we mentioned many of their deviant ways. Many of them. And when they were confronted with the truth, they had to do the same way the Kuffar had done at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Come up with a name, give him some false, false accusations, and keep the people away from them so that they can contain and keep their followers. They don't want to lose them. So all of a sudden we had Wahhabis. Wahhabi. You know the Wahhabis, right? They don't like the Wahhabis, man. They don't like the Wahhabis. And, you know, I personally, uh, I consider it one of the seven wonders of the world. In fact, I think it's the most wondrous of the seven wonders of the world. How can someone like Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, who found Muslims worshipping trees, stones, idols, the same way they were at the time of the Quraysh, before the Risala, he found them engaged in the same kind of shirk, he simply called them back to Tawheed. You read his books. Qala Allah wa qala Rasul. Allah said, you know, Ibuduni, worship me. Basic stuff. All of a sudden, you know, this is a Wahhabi and he's the creator of a sect and he's misguided. And if you read some of the Sufi sites, I mean, like I mentioned, you go to the Sufi sites, they have a special tab for Wahhabis. Ya akhi, read, read the lies and the fabrications. You won't believe. You won't believe. They accuse him of all kinds of things. Why? Because he was calling them back to Tawheed and they don't want Tawheed. Some of them are so ignorant, right? That they say, Shaykh Lusam ibn Taymiyyah was a Wahhabi. And come on, Shaykh Lusam ibn Taymiyyah came, you know, 700 years ago. And Shaykh Muhammad ibn Rahab came, you know, and he was born in the year 1111. So how could he be Wahhabi? How could Ibn Taymiyyah be Wahhabi when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab came way after him? And the name Wahhabi came because of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. Ironically, Abdul Wahhab, the bestower, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about Sufi? From Suf, from Wool. Look at the difference in the name. Even Allah made in the name a sign. I mean, they gave us the name. They gave us the name. And we say, listen, if Tawheed is Wahhabism, I'm a Wahhabi. Put me on Facebook. Put me on YouTube. Warn against me and the Muslims who follow this way. We are Wahhabis. If you mean by Wahhabi, someone who likes to worship Allah alone and associate none in worship with Him. We didn't come up with this name. But if this is what you call the people who are upon Tawheed, then let it be. Then let it be. It's better than being called a Sufi or anything else for this matter. We have no problems, man. And we will say it as it is. Now, as much as I wanted to give you a historical background on Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, I realized two things. First, you can access this online. Actually, there's a book called The Wahhabi Myth. And everything you need to know about the da'wah and its origin and what happened to the Sheikh in his life, all this is available within clicks on the internet. So I'm not going to do that. That's easily accessible. Secondly, if I were to defend him from now until next year, this will make no difference to the people who will insist on following their desires. They will think I'm a crazy person, you know, obsessed with another crazy person. So they will not take my speech as something serious. Oh, just another Wahhabi. Of course he's going to defend the Sheikh. So I figured, why don't we address the issues on which we differ. You differed with the Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. We understand. What did you differ with him on? Let us present this and look at it from the Quran and the Sunnah perspective. Then we can judge. If what is correct is with the Wahhabism, you better join and become a Wahhabi without the title. I'm not telling you go out there call yourself Wahhabi. Again, I'm not trying to call for a sect. 
I'm saying if this is the name you will give to the people of Tawheed, then Allah al Musta'an. Allah al Musta'an. Not that we want the names to be there, per se. If you don't accept, however, then Allah Azza wa Jal will deal with each and every person on the Day of Judgment. And this is not a light statement that I said at the end. Those who are listening now and in the future, when we say that you're going to reject the da'wah of Tawheed and insist on some shirk, some grave worship, some other stuff, and then Allah will hold you accountable on the Day of Judgment, that's heavy. Very heavy. You don't want to meet Allah with, with your Tawheed, you know, uh, uh, inconsistent. With your Tawheed defected. You don't want to do that. Now you can meet Allah with all kinds of sins. And we shouldn't. But assuming that was the case, if the Tawheed is sound, then we have a chance. But you can meet Allah with a lot of acts of worship based on shirk, they will be of no benefit on the Day of Judgment. Now, when the Sufis and the grave worshippers and all those decided to reject the da'wah of the Shaykh, then obviously they had to find reasons now on which they can reject the da'wah. They need evidence. And sure enough, in one of the saddest, most pathetic attempts in human history, they looked through two narrations from the Prophet ﷺ, which they used them to claim that you really have to be careful of this guy, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. You have to be careful of him. This is where the horn of Satan came from. Now let me quote to you the two narrations so you will know exactly what we are dealing with. The first narration is the narration which was narrated to us by Bukhari. Let me give you the actual wording exactly. Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh Allah, bestow your blessings on our Sham. Sham is the area that is now called Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine. That, was, that used to be called Bilad al-Sham. O oh Allah, bestow your blessings on our Yemen. Everybody knows Yemen. The people said, O oh Messenger of Allah and our Najd. Our Najd. And we will see what that means later on. The Prophet ﷺ said, there, meaning in Najd, will occur earthquakes, trials, and tribulations. And from there appears the horn of Satan. So he warned from where? He warned against Najd. He was making dua for Ch Sham and Yemen. They said, include Najd. He said, no. There's going to be problems over there. Tight. So they say, okay, Najd is a problem. FYI, Sheikh Muhammad Muhab was from where? From Uyayna, from Najd. Okay, so now this is their first, first point. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's where the guy's coming from. Then, uh, they continue. Then the other narration which they use is a very interesting narration. It's a Sahih Bukhari as well. Hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. See, the Prophet وسلم, was distributing some war booty after one of the battles. And while he was in the process of distributing the war booty, a man no, named Dhul Khuwaisira from Bani Tamim Pay attention now, from Bani Tamim, he said, Ya Muhammad, I'dil. O Muhammad, be just. Very dangerous statement to say to the Prophet Muhammad He, alayhi salam, said, a great pity that you have doubts. If I am unjust, then who will be just? You are a loser and a failure. He's saying to this man, Dhul Khuwaisira from where? From which tribe? Bani Tamim. Now you know who, who was there not to like this kind of situation? Umar. He was infuriated with this statement. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, allow me to strike his neck. The Prophet ﷺ said, no. There's no purpose in killing him. For he is not alone. There's actually a bunch of them. A bunch of them that will come. If you were to compare your prayers and you're fasting to theirs, you will feel ashamed of yourself. If you were to compare to the Sahaba, he's saying, your salah and your siyam to these, these people that will come, you will feel ashamed of yourself. Like, oh, I'm nothing. My salah, my siyam is nothing like these. Then he, alayhi salatu salam said, these are the people who will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond their throats. It doesn't go to the heart. Sounds nice, tajweed. Idgham, Idhar, Ghunna, Bidun, Ghunna, the whole nine yards. A good, nice recitation, but it doesn't go beyond the throat. Then he Alayhi said, with all these apparent virtues, they will leave the deen like the arrow leaves the bow. They will leave Islam. 
So the Sufi said, look, listen, man. First, the fitna will come from Najd. Second, from Bani Tamim. And the only person, according to them, who fits the criteria is Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Because he was from Bani Tamim, from Najd. They said, khalas. Now we have an evidence that this is the man of fitna. This is a man of tribulation. We say we're kuffar. According to them, he didn't make such statements. He was speaking about the acts of the people. And anyways, they made many false ac accusations against them. They said that he must be the one who the Prophet ﷺ prophesied about. And we have to be careful of him. And on these grounds, they justified their insistence on disbelieving in worshipping Allah alone and worshipping dead people, graves, awliya, and as we will see later on in the lecture. But you know what? That's not exactly sound or correct. There's a refutation. Let me give you the refutation. First, the places which were called Najd at that time were 13 places. And the most common one was Iraq. There were 13 places. Najd, by the way, is an elevated piece of land. It's an elevated land, like a, almost like a hill. If you want to say something that is above the average ground level. This was linguistically what Najd meant. There were 13 areas called Najd back then. The most common of which was what? Iraq. That's the first thing you keep in mind. And we will see how this is strengthened. Second, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the fitna coming from the east. And that was the direction of Iraq, according to Ibn Hajar and many of the ulama. Thirdly, in another hadith, in another hadith, uh, let me give you the actual reference of the hadith, because it's a very important hadith. It's in Sahih Muslim. It's in Sahih Muslim. Uh, the hadith of Ibn Fudayl, who reported from his father, from Ibn Umar, that he heard the Messenger of Allah ﷺ say, that he heard Ibn Umar say, Afwan, the Messenger of Allah, while he was pointing to his hand towards the east, he said, Verily, the turmoil would come from this side, from where appears the horn of Satan, and you would strike the necks of one another, pointing at the east. Now, this is further strengthened with the hadith, where Iraq is mentioned explicitly. Iraq is mentioned explicitly. Ibn Umar said to the people of Iraq, how strange is your affair? How strange is your affair? You ask about the minor sins while you commit the major sins. He is referring to them killing Al Hussein. And verily, I heard, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam point towards Iraq and mention from there will come the horn of Satan. From there, the fitna will appear. A. Hey. So this is the second, third point which strengthen, strengthens our position. Abdullah said, O oh people of Iraq, how strange is your affair. This is the point that I missed. O oh people of Iraq, how strange is your affair. You ask about the minor sins while you commit the major sins and verily I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to point towards where you're from and say that from here will come the horn of Satan and you will strike the necks of one another. So who was he addressing? The people of Iraq. And this hadith is where? In Sahih Muslim. Explaining what is intended by that. Secondly, there are around three to four other narrations which are authentic with the same exact mention of Iraq explicitly. One of them in the, uh, narrated by Abu Naim in his Inhal Hilya. The hadith of Ibn Umar, I will not mention the wording. It has also Medina. Oh Allah, bless our Medina, bless our Sa'a. You know, the measuring uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the, the equipment with which they used to measure, which is equal to around three liters. You will need this for Zakat al Fadr Ramadan, insha'Allah ta'ala. Then a man said, An Iraq. In the hadith, the man said, An Iraq. Specifically, the Prophet ﷺ turned away from him and he said, From there will appear the horn of Satan and you will strike the necks of one another. And from, you know, you can tell Iraq has been a place of fitna ever since. And this is where a lot of the fitna happened. After the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu a lot of the issues that happened between the very various Muslims, a lot of the fighting, the bloodshed, the killing, happened all where? In Iraq. Which was what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was referring to. We continue. The ulama which mentioned that Iraq was intended specifically in the hadith were like Al-Karmani, 
Al-Khattabi, Al-Aini, Al-Nawawi, Ibn Hajar and many others. All of them agree that it has to do with what? Iraq, not Najd. The one that they are referring, Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Abdul Wahab to. Not that Najd. Because we said there are 13, now the other narrations explain the previous ones. The other narrations explain, and this is a principle in Islam. You have to understand the texts in the light of other texts. You can't just read one text and ignore all the rest. Otherwise, you will have a misunderstanding of Islam. So this is something that we all agree to. So why do they reject the other narrations? Why do they not make mention of the narrations that specifically and explicitly mentions Iraq? Because if they do, their whole foundation will be destroyed from, from within and then they can no longer scare the people from Wahhabis so they don't mention these narrations. And if they are mentioned, they will come up with lies and fabrications to reject them. It doesn't end. There's a hadith in a tabarani al-awsat for Ibn Umar and a tabarani al-kabir for Ibn Abbas. All of them mentioning what? Iraq, specifically. Furthermore, the niche for the people of Medina and the direction of East was Iraq as explained by Ibn Hazar al-Asqalani, the one who did the sharh of uh, Sahih Bukhari, rahimahumullah ta'ala. Sixthly, the virtues of Bani Tamim. Now the man, the Al-Khuwaisira, was from Bani Tamim. Does that make the whole tribe no good? If you have a good family, and one of them turns out to be a thief, can we say this family is no good? No. They maintain their status in the community, yes, this will be a disadvantage because of this person, but that does not undermine the whole family because of one individual. Now, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu wa ardah, he said that, uh, yes, I have loved Bani Tamim ever since I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say three things about them. I have loved them ever since I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say three things about them. Number one, he said, these are the people that will stand the most firm against the Dajjal. When the Dajjal will come, Bani Tamim will be those who will strong the firmest against them. Now, what, did, what is required for you to go against the Dajjal? What do you have to have that is strong? Your Tawheed. Your aqeed has to be sound to deal with them. Otherwise, those who are, you know, not really on their iman, they will believe him and follow him. You must be a strong believer. Bani Tamim. Secondly, so at some point, some people brought the sadaqah which were brought from Bani Tamim. And the Prophet ﷺ said, these are the sadaqat of our folk, our people. Meaning he referred them to himself, alayhi salatu salam. Thirdly, Aisha used to own a slave girl that was from Bani Tamim. The Prophet ﷺ said to her, emancipate her. Verily, she is from the descendant of Ismail. Emancipate her, let her free. She is from the descendants of Ismail ﷺ. Because of these three instances, Abu Huraira loved Bani Tamim. So Bani Tamim are actually people of virtue, not what they claim. So these are the ways with which we refute their statements. Tayyip. Now that does with the idea of Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab and whether he is a good man or not. Uh, and we already explained that they don't like what we're saying, but we still have to mention the information for them. And Allah is the one who guides. Why do we differ with them? What did he call to that they didn't like? Who can answer me? There are many things, but you can give me one answer. What is one thing he was calling the people to which they were not really entertaining? And that caused conflict. Without a doubt. Tawheed al-Ibadah. Okay. Specifically. Visiting graves. Well, specifically traveling to graves. Because you can visit the grave. There's nothing wrong with you. Actually, it's a sunnah to visit the grave with what intention? To make dua for the deceased. Not to make dua to him. Make dua for him. Oh Allah, forgive him. Don't say, oh, ask Allah to forgive me. This is how they, you know, they went there, got confused. They didn't know who's supposed to speak to who. Instead of them asking Allah to forgive him, they asked the dead man to ask Allah to forgive them. Ajib. A living person asking a dead person. You know your affair, but you don't know his affair. Maybe they moved him. Maybe he's not there anymore. Maybe he's burning down there. I mean, come on, there are so many possibilities, right? And many of these shrines which they have, 
actually don't have the people they claim in there. They just build a shrine and you know, they make a man stand there, he collects money from the people, and there's no one there. Cockroaches maybe. And people are asking cockroaches for help besides Allah. That's, what hap that's what's happening. Misconceptions about Islam. He called them to abandon the idea of you know, packing your clothes, and you remember now, they weren't going no khuruj and awda, you know, exit visa, and passports and all that. A man would get on his camel or horse or a donkey and go some months traveling to visit a dead man in the grave, hoping he would fulfill his need. While he could have stayed at home and said, Ya Allah, and it would have been over. Subhanallah. That's what happened to them. That's what the Muslims were doing and he tried to stop them. طيب. Forget about what he was saying. Forget about what they're saying. Let's see what did the Prophet ﷺ say. Now if anyone hearing me has a problem with what the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, then he is almost outside of Islam. If he has a problem, he doesn't like what he's hearing because he goes against what he likes to do, then he needs to reconsider whether he is still a Muslim or he has left the deen. You can't. You cannot dislike anything which Allah revealed. Anything. Even sisters. I know you don't like your husband having a second wife and you may dislike the idea because of jealousy, but disliking the idea, the actual teaching of Islam which Allah revealed, no, 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 no. You gotta like it. Yes, you have that. That jealousy in you, the nature, no one will deny it. Even they deny that even the Sahabiyat, the wives of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had that problem. But they could never, and they would never, and neither can we say, well, I don't think this is a good teaching in Islam. It's not fair. That will, that will put you somewhere else. Okay? So I'm saying this because we will quote some hadith which they don't like. And they don't quote. And it, it bothers them. It bothers them deep within. But subhanallah, we love the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Who said? In a hadith which is agreed upon by Bukhari and Muslim. La tushaddu al-rihal illa ila thalathati masajid. Al-masjidu al-haram wa masjidi hadha wa al-masjidu al-aqsa. You should not undergo a journey except to one of these three masajid. The masjid al-haram, Mecca. Masjid Hada, he's saying this hadith in Medina alayhi salatu salam, his masjid. And Al Masjid al Aqsa, where? In Jerusalem. We all agree? Okay. You do not undergo a journey for, to any place. Now, some people misunderstand and they think this is only about masajid. And they think they can go for other purposes. No. Evidence. In the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, in her authentic narration. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, I met Basra ibn Basra al-Ghafari. And he said to me, where are you coming from? I told him from Turi Sayna, from the mountain of Sinai. He had went there. He told him, had I met you before you went, you would have not gone there. Had I met you before you went, you would have not gone there. Verily, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, and he quoted the hadith. That means that the Sahaba understood that now the mountain of Sinai, what happened there? This is where Musa received revelation. And the intent was, this is a virtuous place. He used the hadith of the three masajid to explain that you don't travel anywhere with the intention of a special blessing because of the virtue of the place. So those who like to go to the Ghar Hira and all these thinking there's a special barakah, this is a bid'ah and an innovation which the Sahaba didn't do. And when one of them did it, he was corrected and rectified. So not only the masajid, if you were to undergo a journey for the worship of Allah, seeking nearness to Allah, it better be one of these three, these three masajid or stay at home. Stay at home. Don't go anywhere. This is not Islam. Being attached to physical locations and geographical locations and all this, it doesn't work. Even the, the shajara, shajara al bay'ah, where the Sahaba gave allegiance to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when, when they saw Umar, saw that the people were going to pray there, he cut it. He cut the tree. Because it was starting to become a fitna. People now wanted to do salah in a place which they considered what? Virtuous. 
When Umar radiallahu grabbed the Hajar al-Aswad, what did he say? Inni a'lamu innaka Hajar. Well, I know you're nothing but a stone. You don't benefit, you don't harm. Had I not seen the Messenger of Allah kiss you, I wouldn't kiss you. This is the aqidah of what? The Sahaba. They were very firm in belief in Allah. They weren't getting attached about everything. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ himself was a blessed man. And they used to seek blessings in the sense that Allah made him blessed with his sweat, alayhi salatu salam, with his saliva, with his hair. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. That Allah is the one who gives the blessings. But that was during his life, alayhi salatu salam. Concerning what happened after he passed away, this is an issue of dispute. But what about others? Did the Sahaba, did, did they go to Umar, uh, Abu Bakr, say, Abu Bakr, give us a, you know, a hair of your lihya? And they start you know, wiping their face. I've seen you know, this guy, Sheikh Hazim, uh, Nazim, Nazim. Allah, this guy, man. I, you know, you won't believe the Sufi, man. Sheikh Nazim, uh, billah, ya akhi, I, I, you know, I've been looking at the YouTube videos. It's crazy stuff. He's sitting with a bunch of people. You know, you know, he's like a break dancer, by the way. He stands in the middle and they have all these people, you know, clapping and they got the drums and he goes like this. And then he orders the people with his hand, you come like this, they come kiss his hand. Another, and then in another video, right, they have their own, you know, these are their parties, like a disco. They have a circle in the middle, people dancing, jumping around, you know, like monkeys going around. And he's the maestro, you know, going like this and up and down. Allah, Allah. This is Sheikh Nazim. He said, uh, he said, if these Wahhabis, you know, tell these Wahhabis, what is the name of the tower? Evil, evil Tower? They told him, Evil Tower. Evil Tower? I will go to the Evil Tower and tell God, throw me if I am wrong. You know, some, some, some nonsense, man. By the way, he hates the Wahhabis. He has a huge propaganda against them. Shame on a man this old has huge followers. They call him the living saint. He's like the living saint. No, no doubt, no knowledge, no nothing. Nothing, nothing to offer the people, except that he misleads the masses of Muslims. And you read the comments. MashaAllah, beautiful song. <laughs> That's Islam, beautiful song. Nice dancing, you know, for the, for the events that they have. That's Sheikh Nazim for you and Kabbani and all these, you know, all these group of people. This is what they're upon. This is what they're upon. Walil Asaf Shadid. And, and the worst part is that they come and they turn the fingers against the people who love the Sunnah and love Allah Azza wa more than anything else in the world. And they give us names so they can scare the people away. So under the, under the, the slogan of Wahhabism, now you tell any Muslim, from the Middle East or the subcontinent, this hadith is da'if. All you have to do is say this hadith is da'if today. What is today? The 15th of Sha'ban. Just tell any Muslim who's among those, today the hadith about this da'if, ala tool you become a Wahhabi. Now he's been programmed. Be careful, man. Be careful of these Wahhabis. Anything you hear from them is no good. So you can swear by Allah and show him the hadith da'if, he will not believe you. Do you see why it's dangerous? Why is it dangerous? Because the average people believe it. It doesn't matter that they call us Wahhabis. The problem is when now you try to give da'wah to the people and you simply call them to Tawheed and Sunnah and they start sensing it, they have a sensor. Say, okay, going up, boom, Wahhabi. Go, go, you know? I know, don't teach me. And so how will you give da'wah? It becomes a problem. The same thing the Prophet ﷺ suffered from. Calling them names, the people don't want to hear the da'wah. But guess what? Those who have goodness in them, Allah shall guide them. As many of our brothers, alhamdulillah. They used to be on that old, you know, that old uh, disc and that old track. And Allah guided them to the truth. And we hope that others will be guided accordingly. Bi'ibnillahi azza wa jal. Tayyib. Now what about building on graves? We said you cannot travel now to any place. So going to Maqam Sitna, I don't know who, in some country out, out there, is no good anymore. Because the Prophet ﷺ prohibited that you travel, you undergo a journey, accept the three masajid. Understood? Understood. Let's say they ignored us. And they ignored the Messenger of Allah. They insisted on going there. Now they want to build a shrine. Let's see what the Prophet ﷺ said to teach these people who don't want to be taught. And the hadith in Sahih Muslim. إِنَّ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ 
كانوا يتخذون القبور مساجد ألا فلا تتخذ القبور مساجد فإني أنهاكم عن ذلك and this he alayhi salatu salam said this five days before he passed away alayhi salatu salam five days he said verily those who came before you used to take the grave sites of their uh, they used to take the grave sites of their prophets or in this hadith he, they used to take the grave sites as places of worship as places of worship nay verily i say to you do not take the grave sites as places of worship. فَإِنِّي أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْ ذلك, I prevent you, I prohibit you from doing that. Look at the emphasis. First he told us what they did. And we have been taught that what? We don't follow the ways of the disbelievers. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضلين. First he mentioned them. So that's the first warning. Secondly, he told us what they used to do. Don't, la tattakh, la tattakh, do, not, do not take them, I forbid you from doing that. So you see the emphasis? And they still do it. He said in another hadith, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى اتَّخَذُوا قُبُورَ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ مَسَاجِدْ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ in Bukhari and Muslim. May Allah curse the Jews and the Christians. Or Allah has already cursed the Jews and the Christians. They have taken the grave sites of their prophets as places of worship. Isn't that what they're doing in the Masjid al Nabawi today, some Muslims? Exactly. He must pray near the grave, preferably towards the grave, not towards the Qibla. They, and, and this is the Prophet. Don't ask about all the other, you know, Maulanas and all the other awliya which they came up with. People who may be innocent from the shirk, all these are being worshipped and they go and place, they, they, they build constructions over their places, over their graves. The Prophet ﷺ said in another authentic narration, Among the most evil of people are those whom the hour will occur against them. When the, when the zalzala will happen, these are the ones alive, these are the among, among the most evil of people, and those who take the graves as places of worship. SubhanAllah, among the most evil of people. And you know how many Muslims are going to these graves, man. And you know what's happening. This is no secret to any Muslim in the world. It's on TV, it's on, the, you know, it's on videos, it's all over the place. There are books written about it and calling to it. Now, some may say, Oh yeah? Well, what about the grave of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What about that? That's in the masjid. What's your problem? Why are you praying over there? How come they did it? So what do you say? We say, listen man, you're confused. Where was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam buried? Where was he buried? In the chamber of who? Aisha. Was the chamber of Aisha in the masjid? Can his wife's chamber be in the masjid? It wasn't in the masjid. Where was it? Around the masjid. The chambers were around the masjid. The place of salah had no chambers in there. Now, this is where he was. When did that change? In the khilafah of Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Isn't that his name? Walid ibn Abdul Malik. During his time, when they wanted to expand the masjid, they actually built a construction to still make a partition and keep the, they didn't build it on the grave. They built a construction around it, keeping the grave as is, as opposed to those who build the shrines on the grave, and then they expanded the masjid in that direction. Wrong move, no doubt, wrong move. But qaddar Allahu wa ma sha'afa'al. Can we use the actions of this person as a hujjah in the deen of Allah? Does that justify us building now uh, constructions over graves? Because some man, some khalifa, at some point in time did that, Erroneously? No. We cannot do so. So that is, this is, I mean, this doesn't hold any water. This is a baseless argument. No one can really dispute about that. Ibn Umar, and to further explain this, in the hadith of Ibn Umar, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, pray some of your prayers at home. Do not take them like graves. Don't make your homes like graves. What is he trying to say? That you don't pray at graves. Like the graveyard is a place that you don't pray. And we have many narrations to support that. Exception is to what? 
janaza prayer. Exception is to the janaza prayer, this is a special salah for the deceased. Otherwise, he said, don't make your houses, your homes, like the graveyard. Pray some of your prayers at home. Meaning don't pray all the sunan in the masjid and have nothing at home. Because if you don't pray at home, it becomes like a what? A gravesite, a graveyard. And people don't pray in the graveyard. So this is clear. This is a clear understanding. It doesn't need a philosopher. Furthermore, he said, alayhi salam, in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the whole earth is a place in which to pray except graveyards and bathrooms. Clear. Everywhere in the world you can do salah except the hammamat and the graveyards. Explicitly mentioning that the graveyard is not a place to do salah. What were these people doing and what do they continue to do today? They go and pray specifically there and then they turn their fingers and say, we are Wahhabis. Tayyip. They don't listen. We said, don't travel. These, they said, we shall travel. We said, look, don't build anything. They said, we will build. Bye. Now that you're there, and assuming there's a dead man in that grave on which there's a big, big shrine with, you know, golden fence and, you know, nice fancy carpets, you know, thousands of, of reals are spent on maintaining these things, right? Flowers are brought all the time, blah, blah, blah. Tayyip, there's a dead man there. Can he hear you? Can the dead hear the living? If so, then when your best friend dies, it doesn't matter. You can go over there and still say, how's it going, man? You know, life's good. I got a new, you know, uh, a new uh, channel on YouTube, a new page on Facebook. Life is good. How's everything with you? And you know, he sent him a text message. <laughs> And people, do you see people going, now who does that by the way? The kuffar. They go, they have a conversation with the dead person. And you know, it, you know, to us this is something reprehensible. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Now we will explain. Because some people have a misunderstanding. First, brothers and sisters in Islam, the Quran specifically and directly addresses this issue. Two ayat that cannot be refuted or disputed concerning this matter. The first one, Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Inna kala tusmiu al-mauta, wa la tusmiu al-summa al-du'aa ida wallu mudbirin." Verily, you cannot make the dead hear. You cannot make the dead hear, and you cannot make the deaf hear the call when they turn around and retreat. Allah is telling the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The same way you're giving da'wah to these kuffar and they're not hearing you, they're not hearing you. Why? Because they are just like the dead people who don't hear. You give da'wah, there's no benefit. Who does that remind you of? The dead people, you speak to them and there's no benefit. You see the, the analogy? It, I mean, this is clear. This is the tafsir of the ulama. No one denies this tafsir. Now, this is one interpretation. On one ayah, I'm sorry. So you cannot make the kuffar hear the invitation to Islam for they are like the dead who do not hear either. The second ayah, وَمَا يَسْتَوِي الْأَحْيَاءُ وَلَا الْأَمْوَاتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسْمِعُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ Verily, and the living and the dead are not equal. Are they equal? We just said, are they equal? No, they're not equal. We have a whole other way than that, that of the dead people. We, have, we can go do salah, we can do many things, there it's over for them. So Allah said they're not alike. Then Allah went on to say, Verily, Allah makes whomever He wills hear, and you cannot make those in the graves hear you. Listen to that. وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ You know قبر. And you cannot make those in the graves hear. <coughs> Who's saying this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Telling who? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You cannot make the people in the grave hear you. So when these people go on and call on these people, they don't even hear them. And we will see the ayat in the refutation of that. Tayyip. Now why do they insist? Why do they insist that it is okay to do what they're doing? Because of two narrations which they have misunderstood and misinterpreted. And we will deal with these narrations, so we will know. The hadith of Abu Talha, he reported, On the day of the battle of Badr, 
The Prophet ﷺ ordered that the bodies of 24 of the dead of Quraysh will be thrown in, an, in a foul, stinky well in Badr. There's a well, you know the well, where there's water. It was bad, busted, stinky, whatever, the dead animals there, Allah was there. He ordered that 24 of their bodies will be thrown where? In there. There's no hurma for the, for the disbelievers. There's no yani, honoring them or respecting them in this particular sense, especially those ones. Otherwise, if a, a non-Muslim dies, then you bury him in the ground as well. But you don't give him the janazah prayer. Tayyip, on the third day, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mounted his, his animal and he head out. The Sahaba said he must be going to something important. So they went after him. When the Prophet وسلم, made it there, he began addressing those in the well, calling them, addressing them name by name, oh so and so the son of so-and-so, and oh so-and-so, -and -so, the son of so-and-so. He mentioned their names. Then he said, have, we have found that which our Lord promised to be true. Have you found that which Allah has promised you to be true? We have found victory. We have found the Nasr which Allah promised us. Have you found the punishment which you were asking for? Now, this is a very important incident. Now, if you just stop there, if you just stop here actually, what does it appear? It appears like the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is addressing dead people. But, but you have to read the continuation. So, Umar said, you know Umar, Umar is not your average man. Umar, the revelation came in agreement with him and in disagreement with even Abu Bakr and the Prophet وسلم, more than once. More than once. Like the captives of the battle. Where Abu Bakr said, you know, set them free, we'll have him teach us, you know, something. And Umar said, mm. And Allah revealed the revelation in agreement with Umar. The one whom the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, if there was to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar. Umar knew the deen. Umar knew Islam. When he saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi address these dead people, he said, what are you saying to these bodies without souls? What are you saying to these bodies without souls? Do they hear? He's, now he's confused. He's confused. Do they hear? For Allah, the Majestic says, Verily you cannot make the dead hear. The one we mentioned earlier. Right? Now Umar had an understanding. But you cannot make them hear. And you're speaking to them. You know what? You're addressing bodies without souls. Do they hear? Now, if he was wrong, according to the agreement of the ulama, that the job, one of the jobs of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi was to correct people. In such instances, it must be done instantly. There's no takhir. There should be no takhir in bayan al-hukum when the situation is of this nature. Had Umar been wrong, first the Messenger of Allah should have said to him, no, who told you? The dead people here, dead people here, this ayah doesn't mean that. And he would have explained, as in the ayah about, you know, uh, those who believe and they do not mix their iman with dhulm. And the sahaba said, you know, dhulm, you know, lahum al -am. These will have security. These will be the victorious one. The sahaba looked at themselves, which one of us doesn't have dhulm, oppression? Which one of us doesn't wrong himself? So they were, they were troubled by this ayah. That the ayah says that unless you have to be a perfect believer basically for you, you know, to be safe. So they went to the messenger of Allah said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, this ayah is heavy. It's saying, you know, alladheena amanu and the rest of the ayah. He said, no, zulm here does not mean the sins. Zulm means shirk. Have you not heard the statement of Luqman? Inna zulm, inna shirka la zulmun azim. So he explained to the Sahaba who mis misunderstood an ayah that dhulm in that ayah meant shirk. If you believe in Allah and you don't mix it with shirk, you will be safe. It doesn't mean wrongdoing, which is any sin is a dhulm to oneself. So we learn from the seerah then that when the time, when, when it was necessary, the Prophet ﷺ would do what? He would correct the Sahaba on the understanding of the ayah. Like in many other occasions, right? When he mentioned for... Uh, uh, speaking, he has used this ayah to explain the hadith about the one who should not depend on qadar, rather he should strive. I'm giving you various examples which I'm sure you know of. 
Point being, if Umar misunderstood and the Sahaba were present, the Prophet ﷺ would have explained that this is a misunderstanding Umar about the ayah. But he didn't. He acknowledged the understanding. However, he said, he said alayhi salatu salam, by him in whose hand lies the soul of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You did not hear better than them what I just said. Now, now, you did not hear better than them what I just said. Now listen, Qatada added, Allah brought them back, between parentheses, parentheses momentarily. Allah brought them back in order to make them hear as means of scorn and belittlement so that they will feel regret and remorse. See how they understood it? Allah brought them back momentarily just so they will hear this belittlement, this, this scolding from the Prophet Muhammad to increase them in regret. So this is what? An exception to the rule. An exception to the rule. You don't believe me? Let me give you another supporting evidence for that. Ibn Umar narrated the same incident, which is also found in Bukhari. And in that narration, the Prophet said, Verily, at this moment, they hear what I'm saying. At this moment, now, now, only, they hear what I'm saying. When they went back to Aisha, and they told her the story, Aisha said, Aisha said, Verily, uh, no, she said, yeah, what the Prophet ﷺ meant was, now they know that what I used to tell them is the truth. Then she recited, Verily, you cannot make the dead hear. So now Umar and Aisha, both are of the understanding that the ayah mean, you cannot make the dead hear. So after she explained what happened, she commented. She, re she referred to the ayah, that this is an exception to the rule. If someone wants to go against Umar and Aisha, then this is their business. But this is deviance. These are the Sahaba. And we don't know of a Sahabi who understood otherwise. We don't know of a Sahabi who understood that all the dead hear. So now they want to go against the Sahaba. If you go against the Sahaba, you're on the wrong path. That's not the path to Jannah. The path to Jannah is obeying Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the understanding of the early generations with the Sahaba on the top of the list. You go against these, you're gone. You're gone. But you will not be going where you want to go. That's the first hadith which, which they quote and they use it as an evidence for their deviance. There's another hadith. The hadith of Anas radiyallahu anhu wa arda. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when the deceased is placed in the grave and buried and then the, the companions, the people who are with him who bury him, he hears the shuffle of their feet as they walk away, then the two angels will come and make him sit down and ask him. So they say that the hadith mentions that the deceased, once he's put in the grave, he hears what? The footsteps, the shuffles of the feet of those who are walking away. What do we say about this? What we said about the first? Do they hear them speaking? Don't they make dua? Is it, is it in the sunnah to say, Allahumma thabithu in the su'al? Oh Allah, give him firm, give him firmness at the time of the questioning. Did the hadith say they hear what the people are saying? No, they strictly only hear the shuffle of the feet of the people as they walk away, khalas. Two exceptions to the rule. And you must understand the hadith in the light of the Quran. Because Allah told us in Surah Al-Imran that the kitab fihi ayatun muhkamat hunna ummu al-kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat fa'amma alladhina fi qulubihim zayr fayattabi'una ma tashabaha minhu ibtigha'a al-fitnati wa ibtigha'a ta'wilih in the Quran which Allah sent down, they are ayat which are firm, entirely clear. And they are the mother of the book. And others that are ambiguous, that are not entirely clear. Then Allah told us, those who have deviance in their heart, they will follow the ayat and the ahadith which have more than one interpretation. Why? Seeking fitna and seeking false interpretation. The Prophet said concerning this ayah, when you see these people, when you see these people, as that Allah Azza wa Jal described, when you see them going after the mutashabih, know that these are the ones whom Allah described in the Quran, so be careful of them. He was warning us, warning us against someone who will get a hadith that is an exception and generalize it over everything in Islam. 
He will ignore the ayah, ignore the hadith, ignore the tafsir of the sahaba because now his mind wants to accept this one hadith. Allah said these are the people in whose hearts there is what? Deviance. Clear? Beautiful. Tayyip. So that puts an end. They cannot hear. Tayyip ya akhi. They cannot hear. Let us go back to the most basic of things. Can you call on to someone besides Allah? Is this something that Islam allows under any circumstances? Forget about the shrine, forget about traveling to the location, forget about who is in the grave. Let us just go to the most basic level of Islam, the thing with which we entered this deen. Does Islam allow you at any point in time to call on to anyone but Allah? La Allah. Wallah, we don't know of any evidence for that. Nowhere in the world. Now Allah tells us about this. Calling on the dead is, big, is the biggest kind of shirk. This is the thing which Allah will never forgive if the person dies in that state. Inna Allah la yaghfiru ayyushraka bih. Allah will not forgive that someone will associate partners in worship with him. No. Wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. He forgives whatever is lesser than that to whomever he wills. But if you die in a state of shirk, no jannah. No jannah for you. Now let us see. These people say, look, we are calling on these dead people and you are saying what we're doing is shirk, like the kufr. It's kufr like the kufr of Quraysh. But the Quraysh were kufar. They didn't have la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We have la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We worship, we do this, we do that. How can you say we are like them? We say, look, why are you calling on these people? What is the objective? Do you believe that they control the earth? What will they say? No. Some hardcore among them will say yes. But the average one will say no. They, what they will they say? That we either want one of two things. Either shafa'a, we want their intercession, that they intercede for us with Allah. Or what do we want? We want to seek nearness to Allah through them. They're like intermediaries between us and Allah. You say, this is amazing, man. This is the exa exact belief system of the kuffar. And these are the same two reasons they gave in the Quran. No one denied among the Quraysh's that Allah is the Rabb. Right or wrong? وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say, Allah, the kuffar of Quraysh. They will say Allah, they had no doubt. But what was their issue? Here are their two issues. Allah told us, And those who have taken, besides Allah, protectors, helpers, we, they say, we do not worship them, except so they can make us get nearer to Allah. The same exact things of the kuffar of Quraysh. And Allah said at the end of this ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي مَنْ هُوَ كَاذِبٌ كَفَّرٌ Allah will not guide one who is a big liar, big disbeliever. He called them kuffar with this claim. We're not worshipping them, man. I'm not, I'm not worshipping this man. I'm only trying to get near to Allah through this wali, this good saint who's better than me. This is the same thing the kuffar said at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Allah did not accept that, neither did his messenger. He fought against them and that did not permit him to Islam. Believing in Allah being the creator did not permit them to Islam. They had to give up these false gods. They didn't. The second hujjah is what? Shafa'a. And Allah says, وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ and they worship besides Allah. Those who neither harm them nor benefit them. And they say, these are our intercessors with Allah. Say, do you inform Allah? Do you teach Allah concerning that which He doesn't know in the heavens and the earth? Subhanallah amma yushrikun. How perfect is Allah above those they worship along with Him? Allah called it shirk. They're saying, we're only, we're only seeking shafa'ah through them. Allah did not accept that. Allah did not accept that. He called it kufr and shirk. So what are we supposed to do? Once you call on someone, once you say, Ya Fulan, Ya Rifai, Ya Jilani, Ya Muhammad, once you call Ya, the same way you say Ya Allah, you have worshipped this person, period. 
Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna du'a'a huwa al-ibadah. Verily, du'a is ibadah. Is ibadah. And, and we will see the ayah. Allah Azza wa says, Ud'uni, listen now. Ud'uni, call on me. Astajib lakum. Inna al-ladhina yastakbiruna an ibadati sayadukhuluna jahannama dakhirin. Allah said, look at the ayah. Call on me, I will respond to you. Then what did he say? Verily those who disdain, who are too arrogant to worship me, they will enter Jahannam in humiliation. So Allah said, you call on me. Then he said, when you don't call on him, meaning you're doing what? You're not doing ibadah. Meaning when you're calling Allah, you're doing ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal. So there's no excuse. Nahr. Slaughtering is for who? Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. To Allah alone. Pray and sacrifice. Once you sacrifice to someone along with Allah, you have committed shirk. Look, Allah does not even accept. It does not, Allah doesn't even accept that you, you worship others with Him in your niyyah, in your riya, showing off. If you do a deed seeking Allah's pleasure and the people, Allah will not accept it. Let alone sacrificing an animal or calling on someone who's dead. Let alone ibadah of dua. If Allah doesn't accept showing off, He will not accept that good deed. Then what do you say about this? What do you say about this? Allah oh, ajib. So, Allah, let me give you some ayat so we will really remember Tawheed in our lives. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Every place of prostration belongs to Allah. Don't worship anyone with Allah. لا تدعو مع الله أحدا يا أخي والله I don't understand man. I don't understand what do these people want. Allah says, don't call on anyone besides Allah. And these people insist on calling on others with Allah. Allah is telling us, don't do that. This is shirk. This is kufr. You will go to Jahannam. And they insist on the same acts. And then they call the people of Sunnah and the people of Tawheed all kinds of names. <coughs> Allah says, أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ Then who is it that will respond to the one who is distressed when he calls on him? And he will alleviate affliction. Who is it? Allah. At the end of the ayah, it says, "Ailahum ma Allah." Is there any other gods with Allah? Do you do anyone else but Allah he alleviates the harm? Wallahi, these Sufis and these grave worshippers, they call on these dead people, asking them, "My son broke his leg. I need a you know increase in my salary." They send them letters. They call on them and send their requests to dead people. The same shirk which they're supposed to abandon and leave alone. Had they asked Allah, everything would have been fine. Yani they think, I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> Look what Allah says. لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ وَالَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُونَ لَهُمْ بِشَيْءٍ Allahu Akbar. To Allah belongs the supplication of truth. And those whom they call on besides Him do not respond to them with anything. Nothing. Look at this ayah. إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَا اسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ Allah said, if you call on them, they do not hear you. If you call on them, they do not hear you. And if they heard you, they will not respond to you. And on the day of judgment, they will declare their disbelief from your shirk. They will say, Wallah, oh Allah, oh Allah, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani is, is a righteous man. He will say, oh Allah, I had nothing to do with it. Just like Isa ibn Maryam. Just like Isa ibn Maryam will declare his innocence. I didn't say to them except what you told me. Rabbi wa Rabbakum. Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. But the people took Jesus as a God. Muslims fell into the same trap of the Christians. And it's, at least Jesus is a prophet. They, can, they, be, they may be worshipping the most wicked of people. So... Allah says, وَمَنْ أَضَلُّ مِمَّا يَدْعُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَنْ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ لَهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَهُمْ عَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ Who is more astray than he who calls on, besides Allah, one who does not respond to him. And for until the day of judgment, and they concerning their dua are unaware. They're unaware. Can this apply to anyone but the dead? If you called on a, 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 a living person, would he be aware or unaware? He'll be aware. When Allah says they are, they are unaware about their ibadah, this must be statues and dead people. La ilaha illallah. So we say, 
the kuffar, the kuffar of Quraysh, and the Muslims who are engaged in kufr today, they have no excuse to say, well, we are Muslims, because we say, la ilaha illallah. Guess what? The hypocrites, the hypocrites, the munafiqun, did they say, la ilaha illallah? Did they say, Muhammadur Rasulullah? Did they pray in jama'ah? Did they go for jihad? Yes. And did Allah accept them as Muslims? No. What did Allah say about them? إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ The hypocrites will be in the lowest level of the fire. And when they made fun of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba, when they only were joking with each other and, and the way of, and on the way of one of the battles, they said, we haven't seen any, anyone like our Qurra, bigger bellies and more coward. And more, you know, more, they were more cowards at the time of confronting the enemies. We haven't seen anything like our Qurra. Referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and the Sahaba, Allah revealed the Quran. قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ Say, concerning Allah, His ayat, His signs, His miraculous signs and verses, and His messenger, you were mocking? Do not apologize, you have disbelieved after your iman. Allah called them kuffar, because what? They made fun of some of the Sahaba. But they were saying what? La ilaha illallah. Didn't the Sahaba fight against Banu Hanifa? Not Imam Abu Hanifa. Some people when they hear Abu Hanifa ala tool, you know, the, the, the thing goes up, right? The radar or the, the gauge. You know, Bew! Abu Hanifa rahimallah. We love him, don't worry. We love him. Wahhabis love Imam Abu Hanifa. They have no problems with him. Just in case you thought. Because they tell you, you know, we are the Hanafis and this, and then these are the Wahhabis and everything else. They try to make this distinction. We, there are positions which we, the people of Sunnah, follow that only Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah has. The Hanabila, Shafi'iyya, Malikiyya don't have it. And we follow the Hanafi Madhab in that particular area because we are people who go with the Hadith. Wherever the Hadith takes us, we are on the same journey. That's our attitude. And that's the most beautiful thing in the world. Anyways, uh, Allah declared them disbelievers. The Sahaba fought against Banu Hanifa what happened to Bani Hanifa? Does anyone know? They were Muslims, doing everything. Then this guy Musaylama, al kadhab came said, I'm a prophet. They believed them. They became kuffar. So you can bis disbelieve after saying, La ilaha illallah. So now these people say, Wallah, I say La ilaha illallah. That means I must be a Muslim. You cannot say I'm doing kuffar. Say brother, or inshallah you will become a brother, or maybe you're a brother. Once you are doing the act of shirk, that doesn't guarantee you Islam. You, Islam has an entrance and an exit. You come in from this door and you can leave from that one. It's not like once you come into Islam, you're trapped. You can leave easily. You can come easily and you can leave easily. Unless you maintain the Tawheed. So they have absolutely no excuse. So in finality, whoa, I'm sorry. I say, the issue of Wahhabism is a sad issue. And I invite all the Muslims in the world to wake up and realize that this is the same plot that was ma made against the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and the Sahaba. When they adhered to the truth and they were strangers, the people started calling them names, accused them of the most evil of things in order to keep the rest of the people away from the da'wah of Islam. And unfortunately, today among the Muslims, history repeats itself. Anyone who carries the banner of Tawheed and worshipping Allah alone, names must be given to them and the, the most favorite for them is Wahhabis. So many Muslims come to this country afraid and they are warned before they come here, be careful. Or they, so I was speaking to a brother in the masjid, I gave a little talk after the masjid about the 15th of Sha'ban. You know there's no Sahih Hadith. There are two narrations, one in Ibn Majah, uh, one in Ibn Majah, one in Ibn Habban. Both of them are Da'if. There are other fabricated narrations. The ones that may have been okay are actually both weak. And you know, all the festivals of 15th of Sha'ban are done today. So I gave a talk about this is not from the Sunnah, this is a bid'ah, whatever. After I was done, people are, you know, you know, people are shocked. And one man said, brother, you know, I've been doing this for 65 years. 65 years, I can't believe that you're saying this is not from the Sunnah. I said, brother, alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah, Allah allowed you to know before you pass away. Alhamdulillah, you live 65 years not, not doing it. Now you know. And then another one came and said, you know, you know, I cannot tell my father. He called his father. His father told him, tomorrow's Eid. 
<laughs> Wallahi, with these words. So, you know, I, I was like, subhanallah. He told him tomorrow's Eid. So the man, he can't even tell his father. Because as soon as he tells his father, Baba, this is not from the Sunnah, his father ala tool will say, ding, 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 Wahhabi. And then the son is out. He's out. Khalas. He was, he was affected. It's like, a, you know, the, the swine flu? It's a Wahhabi flu. He's infected with the flu. He's done. You know, pray janaza on him. He became a muwahid. That's really, that's the reality of things. People are scared from Wahhabiyyah. Brothers, don't be scared. Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, brought nothing new. He brought the same thing of the Imams of the Madahib and the Aimma of the Salaf. He brought nothing new. Don't believe me? Read his books. They are clear, clear in the message. And you know how they trick people before? They would give him a book that would say Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. He would throw it away. Said, oh, no, oh, this is deviance. So what they did is they printed the same book, put another name. They put another name, they write, so this is a wonderful book, brother. <laughs> Said, brother, this is the same guy that you would know. So, oh, no, this book is no good. So the issue became what? <coughs> sickness. It's a sickness against the name. So in defense of Wahhabiyyah, in defense of the Wahhabis, we are not a sect. We are the Muslims who love to follow the Quran and the Sunnah strictly. People call us Wahhabis, Allah al-Musta'an. People want to call us other names, Allah al-Musta'an. That doesn't affect the truth. The Prophet ﷺ said, They shall remain a group of my ummah. Upon the truth, they will not be affected by anyone who goes against them or does anything else. They will remain and we ask Allah to make us among them. Why are we so confident? Because we don't bring any philosophy into the deen, nor do we reject any hadith or ayah. We go strictly by the Quran and the Sunnah. They say, go there, we go there. Come here, we come here. Khalas. This is our methodology, clear like the sun. There could be no deviance there. But you speak to the other groups, you speak to these other people and you can never get a clear-cut Islam. Everything has subliminal messages. There's, you know, mysticism and depth and all these things. Nothing is clear. Subhanallah, major contradiction. So I invite everyone to become a Wahhabi as in worship Allah alone and worship none with him and follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.